Good evening. I don't stumble to put myself on the court. Thank you for coming this evening. Um, I'm not going to wear the hat and the waistcoat the whole time. This is a little bit on the warm side. This is how I might address had I left for the Lexington call uh, back on April 22nd of 1775. Uh, got a 1750s waistcoat, uh, which some people have said, oh, gee, that's a short skirt. Well, not exactly, but uh, it, is, it does work. It does work. By the time of the, of the Revolutionary War, the men were wearing waistcoats, which really only came down to their waists. So just bear with me one second. I've dispensed with this, and I certainly shouldn't be wearing the hat inside. I do promise not to get any more undressed than that. What I'm here to talk about this evening is Wallingford, the cradle of American liberty. Does anybody have an idea of what really was the start? What, you know, what, what really preceded the revolution. What it really was that one the one thing that happened, there actually you can you can go back to and say, gee, that's really what started the Americans to thinking about and forming their own country. Stamp Act. Sounds good to me. Can't be any more accurate as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> that's exactly the case. And the reason I ask that is because Back in 1763, this is at the end of the French and Indian War, or as people would know it on the other side of the pond, the, the Seven Years' War, there were some high-powered gentlemen in, the, uh, in England who wrote to the Parliament suggesting that the Stamp Act, the duties on all parchment, vellum, all business type of paper, which, by the way, included newspapers, uh, it wasn't just something that, you know, a deed or something like that or other or a contract. It included even such things as newspapers. That this be extended to the colonies to help pay for the war debt that had been incurred during what we call, here on this side of the pond, the French and Indian War. They, in fact, were successful with that, and they decided that it would go into effect on November 1st of 1765. Not quite sure why the two-year delay, uh, but it, it was to go into effect at that point. Well, there was outrage in the colonies with regard to that. They didn't like this at all. And if the if there were not stamps on these legal documents, etc., they were not going to be construed to be legal because the duties had not been paid. And by the way, they, this did get rescinded in March of 8, uh, 1766. I want to quote something here from the history of Wallingford, 1670 to 1956 by Clara Booth Newell. The tranquility of the town was suddenly and acutely broken one cold day in January of 1766, when the Sons of Liberty rode through town proclaiming the passing of the Stamp Act in London and rousing the people to action. The response was spontaneous, and immediately the beating of the drum was heard from one end of town to the other. I sort of wonder how that could be heard from one end of town to the other in as much as we were a town of 120 square miles approximately at that time, including what is now Meriden and Cheshire and part of Prospect, as well as what we know of today as Wallingford. But that is what was quoted. The town crier called through the streets announcing a special town meeting. There were approximately 4,000 people living in Wallingford at the time. The men left their work, ran to learn the meaning the, of the excitement. They remained for a special meeting and took the oath of free man, thus proclaiming them forerunners of American democracy. Now that's pretty much a quote from, from what Clara Newell had written. Wallingford, by the way, was the first town in the Connecticut colony to hold a town meeting specifically with regard to the Stamp Act. And they did that on January 13th of 1766. It is because of the resolves that were voted in that meeting that the newspapers of the day called Wallingford, the cradle of American liberty. And this is a quote from one of them. By their fearlessness and vision, 
the created this proof that they stood by their convictions, the free men needing none to warn them, warn them of impending disaster, demonstrated their character. Vehemently, they told of their inheritance in these fiery words, and this is quoted from the town records. Whereas it appears from the ancient records and other memorials of incontestable validity that our ancestors, with a great sum, purchased said township at their only expense planted with great peril, possessed, and defended the same, we were born free, having never been in bondage to any, and inheritance of inestimable value. They finished off this rousing meeting by voting that any person who used any stamp, vellum, parchment, or paper for which any tax was demanded should be fined 20 shillings. I believe, folks, that's a pound. And in today's world, that pound would be worth $2,569. As reported in the Connecticut Gazette, this is some 70 years later, taken from the Connecticut History Collection. Collections. This is in 1836. At a meeting of a number of the true sons of liberty in Wallingford, in the Haven County, on the evening of the 13th day of January, 1766, after duly formed by choosing a moderator and a clerk, the following resolves were come into. Resolve 1. That the late act of Parliament, called the Stamp Act, is unconstitutional. I'm not sure if this was the first use of that word, but it, it certainly is a very early use of it. And it was intended to enslave the true subjects of America. That was their interpretation. Resolve number two, that we will oppose the same to the last extremity, even to take the field. They were prepared to fight the British if they imposed this. Ladies and gentlemen, this is 1766. This is not 1775, post-Lexington, post-Concord. This is nine years and three months before Lexington and Concord appeared. So to say that Wallingford was in the van in their response to what the British did is really an understatement. The third resolve was that they would meet in, in the Haven and encourage other Sons of Liberty to meet in the Haven on the third Tuesday of February following. And then the fourth one was to go ahead and have another meeting a week or two before that. Now, as I said earlier, the Stamp Act was repealed in March of 1766. However, the matters in the colonies were most unpleasant as time went on. The declaratory acts were passed by Parliament. These reaffirmed their authority over the colonies. Later, the Townsend Acts were enacted. And this was putting duties on various goods, not the least of which was tea. The people were still upset because Parliament had allowed them no representation in this decision, in any of the decisions that were being made in London. Oh yeah, as I said, the tax, the tax on tea remained. We had the Boston Tea Party in 1773 in December. Actually, one of my great-great-grandfathers at the age of 13 or so was one of the Indians, I'm told, or mine, that John Tyler was there. Parliament responded to that in March of 1774 by passing the Intolerable Acts. Among them was the Ports Bill, which closed the port of Boston. Well, Wallingford not to be without having a voice in what was going on, and certainly far from being unwilling to help their brethren to the north. September 1st, 1774, a letter appeared in the Connecticut Journal. Although there were too many of us of Tory principles, yet there are, God be thanked, not a tr few true sons of constitutional liberty. And then as a demonstration of this, about 150 of these respectable gentlemen did on Monday last as public proof of their sentiments and their patriotic resolutions at an elm tree in this town, sacred to liberty, erect a liberty pole, being 110 feet high. It was not the last liberty pole we would be having in this town. And on that liberty pole, they hoisted a pendant bearing the words, liberty, 
and underneath the British Union flag bearing the words, the Congress. That latter was in honor of the General Congress, which was to meet at Philadelphia that same day. And then to testify their warmest and sincerest wishes that a spirit of liberty, union, wisdom, and firmness may prevail in that respectable and important body and kindle more and more in every class of men and British America.